carefully composed the small catechism, which is what we're looking at. Um, specifically, we use it to teach children and adults, in your case, um, who are new to our confession. But he worked on it over the span of about three or four years. So he was preaching on what we now call the six chief parts. So Lord's Prayer, Baptism, Ten Commandments, um, what did I forget? Confession, Lord's Supper, and Creed, right? He was preaching on those things as he was going about the churches in Saxony. We talked about this months ago. As he went about the churches in Saxony, which is where Wittenberg is and all of that, he found that the priests didn't even know what the Bible said, almost, almost universally. Never mind fathers, mothers, children. Well, how are they supposed to? If the priests don't. Right. Exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, as, as with any kind of grassroots what, what renewal or revival. Is that? Oh, is Luther? Yeah. yeah, yeah, 500 years oh, ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I would suggest that if you want to think about time. So it's like 1,500 years after uh -huh. Christ. Right, then... but uh, which button do I push? This one? No, that's not the one I push. So do you think that that was like universal around? Like you said Saxony, Ooh. but would that be like going on in Gaul? And yeah. Like, well, I mean, Saxony, Saxony is Gaul. Saxony is Gaul. The way you want to, the, the problem is, we talked about this at the end of Bible class last week, is that usually the way we think of history is you're here, and then this is the goal, and the goal could be Jesus. Sorry for my handwriting. I should just use my finger. Wait, can you use the other side? Oh. That's, I guess I could. You're right. Right. This is how, then I get my highlighter. Yeah. Oh my. Yeah, there's two. I think I set it up that way. Anyway, there's, this is how most people think of history, right? Is that whether it's your personal history or world history or United States history or whatever, is that we start here and our goal, we have, we're going here and then you could call this, we like to use this word today, progress, right? And progressive people think that we're not where we need to be, we need, but there's somewhere we need to go. Uh, unfortunately with progress is, um, where are we progressing to? And what? Save your words. What's that? You answered my. Your boards. To, to save your boards? Do you save your boards? Do I save them? Save I think they do them. save them somewhere. Them. I think I have it set up to save. I don't know. Doesn't matter. Oh, can you take a picture? Um, I can save the board. Look at that button yes. there. I don't know if that did what that did. Okay, there it saved it somewhere. I think. Okay, uh, that's how most people think of history. Is like, and whether it's your personal or your family or, right, we're just, we're getting better and better and we're getting closer and closer to the goal, right? This is not the, what the Bible teaches. And this is really important with uh, what we're going to talk about today. So I'm glad it came up. Most people think of, um, think of history that, in that kind of linear progression. Of course, the problem with that, I should go back to it. The problem with that is, what does this look like? What does heaven or who is Jesus? I don't remember this is going to mess it up. Yeah. Now it's just J. Who is Jesus? What's the goal? Right? And people will say things like perfection, or if you want to be real churchy about it, holiness, or goodness, or longevity, or what? Like in our country, it's prosperity, human flourishing. People have all sorts of words. Yeah. Um, but all of those are kind of, even Jesus is kind of, what, what does that look like? Because we've never been there. Right. So we wouldn't even know if we got there. <laughs> right? Enlightenment. Right, enlightenment. Yeah. Um, today, you know, since we're all really just pagans at heart, you know, we, the, the goal is to transcend the body, actually. Is, and that's been the case since the Greeks, even before the time of Christ. They were trying to transcend the body. Buddha, you know, that's Eastern, but it's the same idea. It's like to, to overcome okay. suffering and transcend into kind of some spiritual being. So we have that sense that there's some higher existence, but we don't know what it looks like. So we wouldn't even know if we got there, right? Um, that's why I think, especially politically speaking, but morally and ethically, when people talk about progressing and now we're more progressive, we know better than, than our parents and grandparents did, right? It's always what children think. I was gonna say, we think we do. We think we do. I don't know. And, and when we mature, we're like, 
Yeah, I think we lost, I think we lost something in translation here, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, is that you don't know what you've lost until it's gone. Well, that's a song lyric, but whatever, it's true. Um, right? And unless you maintain some kind of memory of it, you can't ever get back to it. If you did want to go back. But they, no, if you're a progressive person, whether you're a progressive Christian or a progressive political person or a progressive scientist or whatever, you don't ever want to go back to where you were. All right? And again, that, the Bible has a, a major issue with that because, you know, the goal, um, you know, you can call it heaven or you could say Jesus, like we did before, right? Or you could say Adam, or you, and you could say the garden, right? Garden of Eden? Yeah. As far as the Bible's concerned, these are one and the same thing. Adam, before the fall into sin, that's what Jesus, that's who Jesus is. I mean, they're not the same person, but Adam without sin, Jesus. Man without sin. Sin, also God, right? So he's a little different that way. So in the New Testament, this is called the old Adam and Jesus is called the new Adam, for example. So that is the goal. We know what the goal is because we, we were there, <laughs> right? There was the garden and all things were good. Jesus even said, you know, at creation, it is very good on the seventh day when he was resting from all the work that was done. All right, so we do know where, where we'd like to end up, which is actually back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, what? Well, but, say, but, but better actually, but yeah. You can't go back. You can't? Unless, unless history, history isn't a progression up, but it's actually a circle mm. or a cycle, you might say. Okay. Um, and so the, the, the cycle could be, um, what could it be? It could be, there's different words for it. Epoch. Eons, I mean, it depends on whether you're Greek or Hebrew. Um, what else are they called? Um, it could be decade, it could be, what, millennia? You said 1500? Mm -hmm. I can never spell millennia. Millennia, uh, it could be hundreds. You just, you know time. Hundreds, decade. Like, you're from the, I'm from the 70s, you're from the 80s, whatever, you know. People use decades to mark time. Millennial. Millennial, right? So then, <laughs> other kinds of things. Years. Months. Yeah, I was gonna say time. Right, and days. Yeah, these are all different ways of talking. Or day, actually. I should just say day. Singular. All right. So, yeah, time, right? And you can think of cycle of history in terms of your day, morning and or evening and morning is the way that Genesis talks about it, right? Evening, morning. It keeps repeating, right? You go to sleep, you rise up. You go to sleep, you rise up, right? We call that the grind, I guess, the daily grind. But the Bible says that's good, actually. <laughs> that's how he made us. He made us for refreshment and restoration and then work and then to rest and to work. And you know, this is what he made us for. And of course, worship is through that all. Um, you can do it in months. You can do it in years. The Bible does too. Um, although the Hebrew calendar had 13 months, not 12, of 28 days, which gets a little bit confusing after a while because things don't quite line up. So it's hard, it's hard to date things in the Bible that, because of that because they use different calendars. But generally speaking, 12, 13 months. 12 is Roman, Greek and Roman, um, whereas 13 is Hebrew. Uh, what did we say? Years. So the Bible has um, even teachings about specific spans of years. So after 10 years, this. After 50 years, year of Jubilee, you've probably heard about something like that in, in ancient Israel where God actually commanded that debts be forgiven every 50 years um, and that people would be set free within within their community, all right? So nobody, you couldn't be a slave into generations. You can only be a slave into one generation because it would always be forgiven either for you or your children, right? Everybody was getting set free continuously, all right? But you didn't want to be a slave, so you didn't go into debt if you could avoid it, right? Hmm. Of course, that's, there's something to be learned there. Millennia, people sometimes do, or hundreds, dec, you know, hundreds of years. We do that, millennia we do. So we said the Reformation was 500 years ago, plus or minus. Uh, 1517 kind of is where people date it, but um, I say the Reformation finally is official in 1530. So we're coming up on a few years to that, about 500 years. Um, but 1500 years before, a lot of things can happen in those 1500 years. And the reason I brought all this up, this is what we're gonna talk about in a minute, but um, also because 
what Luther did in the Reformation to go about the church is preaching from the scriptures and the catechism. Um, wasn't, he wasn't the first person to do that. There was a guy named Jan Hus who had been burnt at the stake because he had gone back to the Bible and began teaching what, what the Bible explicitly said rather than what the church was telling him to teach. Or just some kind of heretic? Mm -hmm. He was about 100 years before about Luther. Church. Yeah, about 100 years before in Yugoslavia. The only reason Luther didn't, modern, well, it was Yugoslavia, now it's the. I don't know if it's Slovak Republic or Croatia or where it was. Um, the only reason Luther wasn't killed, even though he had a death warrant out against him by the Pope and the Emperor, because they worked together. Uh, actually, the Pope established the Emperor. His prince hid him in a castle called the Wartburg. Right? And the Wartburg Castle um, was a famous castle. Uh, it's where Elizabeth of Hungary did her missionary work from. Or not missionary work, his charitable work. She, had, her husband died when she was like 18, 16, 17, something like that, and she never remarried. Um, she had already had a couple of children by that point too. Interesting, different time. And then, um, um, yeah, she was known as like, I mean, she's a renowned character in Europe for her charitable work, hospitals, and other things, right? And that was her castle, but that was a couple hundred years before Luther. So um, anyway, yeah, he, he was hidden by his prince in a castle so that, and protected, you know. And he, and he wore an outfit. He grew out a beard and did all sorts of How things. How does somebody like that um, become such a public figure? Like, how does that happen? Like, how does Luther? Like, is he writing while he's hidden? Uh-huh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's where he worked on... So that's, okay. that's where he worked on his translation of the Greek New Testament into German. Um, I think he started to work on the Old Testament as well. It was two years that he was in hiding. Okay. Yeah, but he was still writing letters and whatnot. They were the the thing is is it's like any kind of tyrant. They don't. It's like he's in his castle. He goes storm his castle, go get him. He's like, come storm my castle. And there's political reasons why you wouldn't do that because you're going to have to invade yeah. a prince's territory. Just like any any kind of tyranny, everything's dependent upon them keeping up the illusion that they're in charge. <laughs> So they don't want to reveal that the prince actually can do what he wants and he doesn't have to listen to the Pope. And eventually that's it ends up what happening. All the, the princes of Saxony and Hanover and all these different German territories, they band together and say, we're not going to listen to you, Pope. And the Pope goes to war to him for 30 years to try to wipe him out. So, yeah. Uh, but anyway, my point was, is it wasn't the first time it happened. Over and over in the history of the church, there's a time of, I would say, like flourishing of faith. People believe what the scripture says. And then teachers come along, people follow after those teachers, the teachers depart from the word in one way or another, those things kind of get entrenched, and then we forget, like, who were we? I'll use an example here, which we can talk about next week some more if you want, um, is for the history of this congregation, we didn't do what our Lutheran confession said we did as far as our practice of the Lord's Supper. So our, our, our confessions, which say, here's what we believe. They're in our, in our constitution. They're, in, they're actually in the official name of the congregation. This is what we believe. Unaltered Augsburg Confession is, is specific. And the unaltered Augsburg Confession says that we celebrate the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day, every Sabbath. Right. Oh, it says that. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. But this congregation, that. this congregation never had. So never when had. Never had oh, okay. in their history. So they always do monthly? I think we it was monthly? It was quarterly, monthly. We don't use yeah, my point was, is that then I say, hey, let's have it every Sunday like our confessions say we do. Um, and, and really what the, Lord, what the Lord wants. Yeah, it was coming out of COVID. And people are like, but we've never done it that way. And they were right, except the problem was they didn't think back far enough. They were only thinking back to 1845 you know, and the congregation being founded or something, right? Or the people starting to come to church here. But they didn't have a pastor. So when they first started gathering, and then for the first probably 75 years of the church, of the congregation, at least the first 50, they didn't have a pastor every Sunday. Some Sundays they did, some Sundays a, a father. They shared, right? Yeah, they shared pastors because uh, they weren't, well, when you're German speaking primarily, you need a German speaking pastor. So they had to come or they had to be raised up in the churches. Anyway, it took some time. And English actually changed it because <laughs> then you could, you had a much larger um, pool, right? So when would that have been? Here in the history, I'm, I'm sure Wamsconts spoke English, probably listed too. Cold did not, I'm sure, right? And then you get to like Hubner in 1896. He stays till 1941. 
right? He's been he, he's the longest running pastor. Yeah. Um, and he got it. And he, uh, he ended up as a missionary and his son went as a missionary too. So after serving for 40, what? Yeah, 45 years, 46 years, he did some missionary work after that. Um, that was, I think that's what his doctorate was in. But there, you can see the clear transition. Also, the, you yeah. can see what happened. Beard, 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 no beard. English. <laughs> no, it's World War I. Gas masks. You can't have a beard with a gas mask. It doesn't fit. No, it doesn't work. All right, so daily. Uh, we want to look at daily today um, because this history or this cycle is, uh, according to scriptures, Romans 6, actually the daily life of the Christian. Is that we, if you want to put it this way, I don't know, let's see, the arrow's going this way. So we'll say, oh, it didn't do the other color. That's so sad. Oh, because I have to do this, maybe? See, I have to learn how to use this. Come on, you can do it. All right. Uh, uh, you're still in your race. Am I? Oh, I didn't go back. Okay. Die. That's nice. Big bold letters. <laughs> and rise. Or you could say death and resurrection. It would be another way to say that. So St. Paul says in our baptism, we daily die. The old Adam daily dies and rises in faith in Christ. Which makes sense, right? Because you go to bed, you die, in a sense, <laughs> right? It's dark and whatnot, and then you rise. When the sunlight comes up, you rise up, right? Sometimes, like, this is why I don't like the school year. You can appreciate this, because we tell the kids to get up before the sun comes up. It doesn't make any sense, <laughs> right? Your body's saying, no, it's time to sleep, and you're saying, no, it's time to get up. Anyway, good luck trying to change the schedule of the school day. Some schools don't start till 9. But then you have all sorts of other issues. It's either childcare at the end or at the beginning, one way or another, yeah. right? Yeah. Daily dying and rising, right? So uh, now Paul in Romans 6 calls this baptism, but um, this is also, baptism is about um, repentance for the forgiveness of sins as well. So uh, confession, and this, this might, might be a surprise, uh, probably to both of you, I don't know. It's a surprise to most Lutherans, actually, okay. is that we come to this part of the catechism, which is, what do we call it, uh, the fifth chief part, something like that, confession, and they're like, oh, what, we have confession? And you're like, yeah, we do. Right? And, and usually the answer is, oh, like what we do before church, right? Where... The creed? No, no, at the beginning. Um, okay. It's actually called... Where's my hymnal? Yeah, this hymnal will work. Any hymnal will do. All right? So, you know, I open up any of the, the daily services. This hymnal, it's harder to find. Here we go. So this one. Divine service, whatever this was. This was our last. And it starts, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, baptism. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just. And that's from 1 John. All right. we're, just, we're just actually just reciting First John, <laughs> which is good. Um, that if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we actually make a confession out loud, right? Not just of faith, but of, but in particular of sin, right? Most merciful God, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess. However it goes. By nature, I am sinful and unclean. What we're doing there is we're simply just saying out loud what the Bible says about us according to the flesh, according to our our nature from birth, right? Outside of faith, actually, right? Because apart from faith, I can do no good. This is what, what the apostle says, right? And so then you say all the things. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done, by what we've left undone. Notice it's not very specific. It's kind of... Universal. Yeah, good, universal or general. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. Just saying what the Bible says. Right? But then, in faith, for this, well, actually, the first part you can't say outside of faith either. You can't call yourself a sinner without actually believing what God's word says. You won't. Instead, you'll march in a parade and wave your flag and say, I'm not a sinner. Right, right. I'm not a sinner. Right, look at me. Right, which is not faith. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. So we see that all through the New Testament. People come to Jesus and say, Lord, have mercy on me, or Son of David, have mercy. That kind of thing. So we're doing the same. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your wills and walk in your ways. 
to the glory of your holy name. Amen. All right. And then the pastor actually says, uh, which one? As a called and ordained, see, they changed the words. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins. I forgive you. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, meaning he sent me to say these words to you. So who's forgiving you? Jesus, Jesus is. That's right. Make sense? So we do that in church, and people say, oh, that's confession. And that's right, it is. Right? But the word you use, universal, we usually, I think, call it general, but we could, you could say either. Uh, sometimes we just say corporate confession in absolution, meaning it's the, the whole body together. That's what corpus means. So uh, we have that confession, but that's new. That's only been done in our churches, not even in the whole history of this congregation, only for the last hundred years or so. Um, before that, to confess meant to go to the pastor and to say, I've sinned, please forgive me, right? Um, but you say, well, wait a minute. That sounds like Roman Catholic, right? Yeah. You go to the priest and you say, and then he says, here's, here's how you make amends. Here's your restitution or what's the word they use? Um, acts of contrition, I guess, is what they would say. They have all sorts of words for it. Right? Which is fine. No, I seriously fine. Like after, if you've sinned against someone, go and make up with them, right? right. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that confession and absolution? Hmm, that's a different question. All right, and is that even repentance? It's not necessarily repentance. We do this with the children. You want your children to be repentant, right? And so you say, say you're sorry to your brother, right? You say this all, you say this all the time. Are they sorry? No. No. <laughs> it's kind of performative, right? Um, because they don't actually believe the words that they're saying are, are Christ's words. So that's the, that's the disconnect that God willing, you know, he's going to, that's going to click and be like, wait a minute, when I say I'm sorry to my brother, that's Jesus saying he's, he forgives them. When well, you that's, mi- yeah, that's what we say. We're, Do you? Or always say, you have to forgive your brother. You have Jesus to. Jesus forgave you. Ah, but Jesus forgave you, so forgive your brother. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <clears throat> um, which is the Lord's Prayer, right? Forgive us our trespasses. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, what's interesting then, the reason I brought all that up, is that um, we do have this corporate sense of confession, which is new, but it's not in the catechism, either small or large, because they, ne- they, ha- they didn't do it at the time of the Reformation, what we do. They, when they confessed, they said out loud what was afflicting, actually, I should do this, what was afflicting their conscience or their heart, you might say. You could say it either way. So they're saying, here's pastor, and this is what the priest would do, right? He'll ask you questions in the Roman church and try to get you to say, figure out what's wrong. <laughs> um, what, we would, what we say is something different than that. Is like, what, it, what is it that's, that's terrifying your conscience? And that usually happens because pastor said something in the sermon or in Bible class, and then, he's, and then it bugged you. And you're like, you know, maybe I did something wrong or whatever, right? Or maybe things aren't going... Maybe, Maybe I'm not living the life that God would want me to, right? And so then you come to the pastor and you say, Pastor, talk to me more about this. That's confession, right? There's this dialogue usually with the pastor to say, you know, here's what I've done or here's what I've thought or here's how things are going. Something doesn't seem right. You know, provide me some... Ultimately, what you want is you want your conscience comforted so that you know you're on the right path or that you're steered in the right direction. Yeah, guidance. (laughs) Guidance, hopefully... Not just from psychology or sociology or economics, although we can talk about those things. Um, but ultimately from God's word to say, here's what God has to say to you. Right? And the ultimate word is always, in all things, I forgive you. That's his word. Because that actually makes everything right. right. And actually nothing is right apart from him forgiving it. As, as Paul, quoting Isaiah, talks about all our works being filthy rags. Same thing Isaiah said, and others, of course. All right, so when we talk about confession, it has in mind what we sometimes call, what the Roman church calls private confession, I think. I like to call it private absolution, (laughs) just to be different, I guess, and confuse people. Private absolution, or personal absolution, if you want. You could do that. Personal forgiveness. Like, Pastor, I need you to say, I forgive you to me personally. Because when you say it up in the front, you're talking to everybody, and you've not actually heard me say, like, what actually is on my conscience, what needs forgiven. Okay. 
So this is kind of revolutionary, maybe not for you, um, but for most people sitting in the pew, they've never done this. I guess like- They've never come into the, they've never said, Pastor, can I talk to you? I've never, always, in their whole life. I called you. <laughs> yeah, you did. But like, I've always wanted that with something that- Right. Um, I didn't grow up with in not being like if I was obsessed with being Catholic forever. I knew that they did that. Yeah. And now, now I would I would suggest this isn't something unique to just the relationship of a of a hearer of God's word to the preacher of God's word or pastor to the member, um, but it's actually the call of every Christian. So you hear this from your children. Your children tell you maybe what they've done, right? They come to you because they're, they're they feel guilt or shame, mm-hmm. right? And then you you're called to do the same thing: is to to hear that, to not talk about it anymore, just forgive it. You might pro- provide some guidance. Here's how you can avoid it, but in the future, right? My kids have confessed to me things, not as pastor, but as father. They, and they, they want to know. And a lot of times what I can say to them is, okay, I'm not surprised, <laughs> you know, especially the boys. I'm like, you know, we have like the same genetic makeup for the most part. So <laughs> the things that you're predisposed to are the same things I, I once was or am or whatever. Um, so you could, there's some fraternity there too, or collegiality or whatever you want to call that. Just um, sympathy, I guess. <laughs> Right, I feel your pain because I've been there. Right, this is we talked about AA. I think last time, maybe I don't know. Um, you know the Bill, whatever his name was, that started AA, picked up on this because he was a well, Christian. That's right. he used to... Yeah, he took out most of the God. He left the God language and he took out the specific Jesus language um, from AA over time. But but the idea that you need you need a confessor, you need you need someone to talk to. Right, so you have a sponsor. That's what sponsors do. Oh, we talked about it in regards to baptism. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, so the pastor can have that relationship. And the unique thing that a pastor has, unlike, you know, telling your spouse what you've done or, tell, or your children telling you or you telling your children, by the way, too, you can confess to them, you know, like, I lied to you. You know, I, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. That kind of thing. Um, the difference there is the both the sin, but also the forgiveness have ongoing effect in your relationships there. Right? Because, like, if you sin against your spouse, especially, you know, adultery or something like that, you know, I mean, it's going to stick with you. Yeah, you're going to forgive, but the, but the wounds are still going to be there, right? I mean, you're still going to bear the scars of what happened. Um, that's why, you know, we want to avoid these things as all possible, right? Um, and ask the Lord's strength to do that. Uh, whereas, with the pastor, it's a little bit different because, I'm not saying this is an easy thing to do, but, but it is my call that I never divulge the things that are confessed to me. So Allie said she confessed to me, but I'm not allowed to say now, well, remember what you said, you know, cause that's, that's one reason Guy and I got involved with mm-hmm. this too, was cause we need like, yeah, so separately and together probably. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Good talk to yeah we, we need to, yeah. we, and then, and nobody around us has like spiritual guidance, Mm-mm. even specific any kind of spiritual guidance at all. We're like just by ourselves right. in this as Christians. And it, it's hard. I mean, you might have a, a strong barometer. Barometer? No. What's the thing? Um, not a barometer. What is the thing that gives you direction? A compass. compass. Yeah. You might have a strong compass, and maybe it was instilled in you, you know, through your, from your parents. Your parents like right and wrong. Here's the way to go. Here's the way to go through life. Here's the things to do. It may have been instilled in you, though, by other agencies, you know, could have been school, right? That kind of said, here's what's expected of you and you're to be a good citizen or to be a good worker or something like that. Um, and you may be re- rebelling against that because you're just not, you know, maybe you're like me and you're just not a nonconformist. You're just, no, I'm not going to do what you tell me. I'm only going to do it if I want to do it, right? I'm not going to read that book. <laughs> you can't, I'm going to go read what I want to read, right? Computer magazines or whatever it was. All right. Um, so maybe you don't quite fit in. Is that a sin? I'm not exactly sure that it is, but we're kind of, there's this corporate sense of doing wrong. Yeah, we do need spiritual guidance um, because we don't always know what we're doing. We don't always have a mentor or, you know, strong, you know, a parent, maybe, maybe estranged from parents, whatever it is. Um, We need somebody, you know, we need somebody or some people. I think we need both friends and we need confidants and we need, like you say, a spiritual, spiritual guidance. And it could be more than one too. You know, there may be different resources that you can use for that in addition to a pastor. All right. But here in particular in the catechism, to get to the point, (laughs) finally, 
all right, um, is private confession. So um, Luther says confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins. And second, that we receive absolution, which you see solution in there. So that's connected to water. It's being washed with water like baptism, forgiveness. That we, that we receive absolution, that is forgiveness, in case you didn't get that, from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. All right, so these were kind of revolutionary words to people then because they did not think that they went to confession for absolution, for forgiveness. They thought they went to confession to be told that they were wrong and told how to make it right. But there was ultimately no God involved, really, except for just like guidance or direction. But God didn't have to do anything with you, right? Maybe you would pray for the Holy Spirit to help you do better. But um, Luther rightly recognizes that all throughout Old and New Testament, that repentance is always for the sake of forgiveness of sins. You, always, you turn away from your sins back to God in, for, for life or forgiveness or salvation, however you want to look at it. Those are almost synonymous. They're different, but they're almost synonymous. Right? And it's for the sake of faith, too. We actually tell God, we, we say to God what he's already said to us. You're a poor, miserable sinner. And we're like, okay, yeah, you're right. We are a poor, miserable sinner. This is Adam and Eve in the garden, right? Yes, you're right, God. And God says, here's what's going to happen as a consequence. You're like, oh, okay. And he says, but don't worry, right? I'm going to send my son or the offspring to crush the serpent's head. I'm going to save you from this. So rest in hope. You are forgiven, right? And then he clothes them with animal skins. Yes, he sends them out of the garden, but he doesn't kill them, <laughs> which is another way of saying... <laughs> That's an, I mean, they deserve to, they deserve to die. So he had mercy on them. Yeah. Right. He didn't kill them, even though that's what they deserved. And they even agreed that they deserved that. Okay. Yeah. Um, ultimately the, the absolution is directing you toward, where was my history thing? Uh, how do I get back to that? Which button was it? Was it this one? No, I always push the wrong button. This one. Ultimately the goal is to get back to rise to new life and to be with God forever, right? So everything God is doing through history, whether, whatever, however you want to demarcate that, he's working all things together for your good, that is to save you from your sins and to restore you to himself and to restore what, what uh, Revelation calls the new heavens and the new earth. New heavens and new earth. Creation, same thing. Make sense? Okay. So, no, he does not kill them immediately. Um, yes, they still die, but they don't die eternally. They only die for now until the resurrection on the last day. So even absolution, this is a little death and resurrection because we have to admit that we're dead, which we can't do apart from faith. We're already dead. Raise me to new life again, right? Again, daily dying and rising. It's kind of our, that is our Christian life. Um, and, of course, it is for faith that we believe that by it, by that forgiveness, declared to us into our ears, not from our heart out, but from God, God's heart into ours, right? He, he speaks to us. That's why he sends somebody to speak to you, because you won't believe it unless you hear it from God. You can't, like, people, uh, what's the George Michael song I always quote? You, you'll, you'll know it, because the kids, the kids never do. They're like, what are you talking about, Pastor? You know, you just got to have faith. And my question is always, in what or who? For what? Faith, like, that's confidence in George Michael's case and his homosexuality, I guess. I don't know. What did he have faith in? I don't even, is he still alive? No. Did, no, he died. All right, so it's kind of a silly song because it doesn't actually have an object. Faith always has an object. It's always pointing to someone or something. You could say, I have faith in, in democracy. People say that kind of language. Well, that's still in something, right? Whatever democracy, well, I don't know what democracy is. All right, so what should we confess? And again, thinking... Corp not corporately, but privately, but personally, if you're going to talk to a pastor privately. Before God, we should plead guilty of all sins, even those we're not aware of as we do in the Lord's Prayer, or as we do before church. In the, what we call, before I, we do the psalm to get up to the altar, right? But before the pastor, we should confess only those sins which we know and feel in our hearts. So notice what's in the heart or the conscience. Knowledge. And, re and the response to that knowledge. So God afflicts your conscience, afflicts your heart by telling you about what he expects from you, and you're like, God, but I haven't done that, <laughs> right? 
And then those are the things that you would confess and say, Pastor, I heard you say in the sermon, I don't agree, or I'm not sure that's really, or it really bugged me, right? And then, then we can have that conversation. I might be wrong, by the way, too. That's the other reason to take it to the pastor. The pastor can say, I didn't say that very well. Or, or you, we completely misunderstood each other. Let's go back to the beginning and let's try this again, right? Um, so what should we confess? And then Luther basically does what's instructed on the screens, actually. If you look up on the screens, it gives you a little prompt to do this um, at the beginning and then also before the Lord's Supper. Consider your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. Say so your place, meaning the place that God has put you, not where you chose to be, but where God put you, um, according to the commandments. I mean, you didn't choose to be a mother. You maybe did, but ultimately without God giving life, you don't have life, right? There's women that want to conceive that can't. There's women who don't want to conceive and do, <laughs> which, you know, anyway, they still had some choice in that, I suppose. Not always, right? There's other situations too. In any case, God gives life where and where he wills. So where did God put you? Are you a father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, or worker, right? You fall into one of the, or more of those categories. These are what we call vocations, callings. Have you been, and then within those vocations, have you been disobedient, unfaithful, or lazy? All right, so disobedient meaning going against the, the rules established by God, right? Not, not whatever the other ones are. Unfaithful. Um, so we use that in terms of like the relationship of husband and wife, right? Faithfulness. It's because the Bible likens marriage to, to our relationship to God. Or actually, marriage was given to teach us about our relationship to God. That's what Ephesians 5 says. So we're faithful in marriage because God is faithful to us in, in our relationship to him. Right? He's, Jesus is described as the bridegroom, and we, we are the church of the bride, for example. He does that. He uses that language, as do the prophets. Right? So faithfulness uh, in marriage. I don't know. Can you be faith, a faithful worker? Sure. What I would suggest that means is actually that you, you work in faith. Not faith towards your employer, because don't have faith in me, right? I mean, hopefully I don't let you down, but, you know, or your other employers, right? But instead that, that, you, that you work according to what you believe, or according to what the Bible says. Hopefully those are the same thing, right? So that you don't steal at work, time or stuff, right? Well, because that's the seventh commandment. It's not that kind of thing. Um, and, or lazy. Well, that's pretty broad, but that's good enough, right? <laughs> we know what that means. Um, have you been hot tempered? Fifth, fifth commandment, right? Murdering. Uh, rude or quarrelsome, argumentative. I always like going through this with the children because they're like, yes, yes, yes. Some of them have gotten <laughs> the idea on it. Um, have you hurt someone by your words or deeds? Children, yes. <laughs> Have you stolen? There it is, Seventh Commandment. Been negligent, wasted anything. So Luther says that all belongs to the Seventh Commandment and Ninth and Tenth. So negligence and waste are connected to stealing. I think we believe, we, we, we understand that, right? Especially if you're an employer with employees, <laughs> then you really understand it. There's people under you. You have people under you, right? Teresa, they work under you? Not right now. Not right now, okay. Well, you have. Yeah, and you know, you know, I mean, you want to be able to say to them, don't steal my time or don't waste my time, right? Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't even resonate with people at all. Or done any harm, right? Now that, most people read through that list and say, okay, yeah, um, I have plenty we can talk about now, <laughs> faster. I have places where that this is certainly true. Um, but we also have other devices or tools. I don't have one here. There's some out in the narthex. Where, we go, where you can go through each commandment and you can see how you've sinned against both God and against one another, the commandments. It hasn't started ringing yet. All right, good. So let me show you one more thing. Again, in the, in the catechism itself, it says, here's a, a right for private confession of Christians at all time. Um, there's, other one, there's other versions, but here's one in the small catechism. And I want to point this out to you because you'll see it's maybe a little bit different then it's certainly different than the Roman rite in some ways. Um, and it's what most people haven't done. It is, it is like we talked about with prayer. There's kind of informal prayer where we just pray from the heart, right? Just the things that are on it. Then there's more formal prayers where, where you do it kind of by a 
kind of a step-by-step. Here's like the Lord's Prayer is a formal prayer, right? But there's other formal prayers that we pray. You can pray both ways. Same thing with confessing. You can say, Pastor, I just want to talk. Or you can say, Pastor, I'm not really sure what's on my conscience. I just, and I, I, I need a, I kind of need a step-by-step. Can I walk through something with you that, that will help, help, help me? And that's what, where the rite of confession is very helpful because it's, it prompts you along the way. Yeah, and or maybe you're not even prepared. Maybe you don't know or you're not prepared to actually say the thing out loud yet or the things, but you just want to say, I'm sorry, just in a more general sense, but privately. You could do that too. Because the point, everything's always about hearing the word of absolution. If you need to get it off your chest first, fine. If you don't, you know, that's okay too. So dear past confessor or pastor, I ask you to hear my confession and pronounce forgiveness and in order to fulfill God's will. I want to hear forgiveness. That's why I'm here. So that's a big way to start, right? And then you can see these words are similar to what we say in church. I, a poor sinner, plead guilty before God of all sins. In particular, I confess that as this, he's just giving this as an example. Here's what I've done that, that really bugs me, right? That I can't seem to stop doing or um, others have told me is wrong or, or I'm just, I feel guilty about or ashamed. And right here it is as a servant or maid talking about saying and doing things and quarreling and grumbling. I have grumbled about the lady of the house and cursed her. You know? Well, fair enough. Okay? And I'm sorry. This is, our confession ends the same way. So in our hymnal, it says, I plead guilty before all sins. In particular, I confess, dot, dot, dot. And then it jumps here. I am sorry for all this, and I ask for grace. I want to do better. Which also presumes I can't. (laughs) Or I wouldn't be here confessing to you. Right? Right. And then the, notice it's the master or lady of the house may say, right? So there's some examples of what they may say. And then finally, the confessor shall say, no options, God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. Amen. Do you believe that my forgiveness is God's forgiveness? Yes, dear confessor. Ooh, I like that. That's not how we do it. In the hymnal, it just says, yes. <laughs> oh, dear confessor. Well, I'm happy to do it. I mean, I like, I don't mind the acknowledgement. Well, you better. Right. What is my job? Let it be done for you as you believe. And then, then you the same words you hear in church, but now spoken privately to you, personally to you. Right. And then usually there'll be other scripture that I can share or some counsel or direction as a result. Right. And this is all because of the office of the keys, which we didn't talk about, but, um, Probably one of the most challenging things for non-Christians to believe is that God actually sends somebody particular to either to bind the sins that you refuse to confess, but also to loose all the sins that are confessed, even those you're not aware of. And you're like, well, how can one person do that, right? Like, what hubris, pastor, to think that you can, you have all that authority. I'm like, it's not my authority, it's God's authority. He happened to delegate it to me, and I don't particularly, I didn't particularly ask for it or want to do it all the time, but this is what he's given me to do. Right? And for your sake, I forgive you your sins. That's ultimately the point. Um, although sometimes you have to say to someone, hey, you don't, you don't think that's a sin? God's going to hold that against you on the last day. Oops, I said that. Yeah. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm actually mad. <laughs> well, I mean, that's unconfessed sin, and that's the tr- reality of that. So that's confession and absolution. That's, hopefully that was helpful. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, so that's the daily, that's when I talked about last week, two weeks ago, baptism being daily dying and rising. That's what it looks like. It's confessing your sins and being forgiven. Either parents to children, children to parents, husband to wife, wife to husband, or penitent to pastor. Regardless, that's our daily life. Or even just generally ourselves to God. Sacrament of the altar is chapter 10. We have more prayers, table of duties, which we can or can't do. But we'll at least do chapter 10. I know you're a little grumpy about summertime, 